Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of South Holland. What a joy it is to gather together in worship as we come here on this beautiful Lord's Day to hear from the Lord and to look to His Word, to glorify and praise and honor Him, to join together as His people, to proclaim to the world the glory of God and the hope that we have in Him. So welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome, especially if you're visiting with us. So glad that you could join us for worship today. We hope you find this to be a a place uh, where God is honored, where his word is believed and obeyed, and uh, where his people can join together in joy and love and fellowship. So thank you uh, for joining us. We uh, meet once again, and you all have done a a lovely job of, of spacing out. Please be aware of that and kind of the ongoing effort that we have to remain in step with, uh, with some of the guidelines and uh, be aware that after the service we'll kind of do as we've done. We'll uh, go out in an orderly fashion. We'll, we can congregate and fellowship outside, uh, so be aware of that as well. As we do week after week, we take some time to silently come before God in prayer in our own hearts, and uh, that is a time of preparation, a time where we recognize that Worshiping God is, is not like the other things that we do throughout the week. It is a special time. It is a very sacred time. It is a time where we expect blessing from the Lord because he has promised to give it as, as we seek him through the means of grace. So in light of that, let's take a few moments in silent prayer and reflection, prepare our hearts for the worship of God, and then I'll bring us together with a prayer of invocation. Great and mighty God, there can be nothing better than to praise your name. And, O Lord, there is nothing better than to declare your loving kindness in the morning on your holy and blessed Sabbath day, the Lord's day, the day of resurrection. For it is your will and your command that we would set aside this day to serve you and praise you. We remember with thanks the creation of the world by the power of your word. We remember the redemption of humanity by the death of your son, Jesus Christ. We declare, therefore, your greatness and your power. Yours is the glory and the victory. We praise you. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, and you excel as Lord of all. Riches and honor come from you. You reign over all. You give grace to all. Power and strength are in your hands. And as by your mercy you have brought us to the start of this blessed day, so we ask that you make it a day of reconciliation between our sinful souls and your divine majesty. Give us grace to make this a day of repentance before you. In your goodness, seal it to be a day of pardon unto all of us. Help us to remember that the keeping holy of this day is a commandment which your finger has written, that on this day we might meditate on your glorious works of creation and redemption, and that we may learn how to keep in faith and in hope all the rest of your commandments. As we meet together to offer a sacrifice of praise, to hear your spirit speak to us through your word, Do not let our sins stand as a cloud to stop our prayers from ascending to you or to keep back your grace from descending to us. May our chief delight be to dedicate ourselves to your glory and your honor. May we not live according to our own will or our own ways. Let us cease from sin, and as we pause from our daily callings, may we, by your grace and blessing, Feel in our hearts the beginnings of the eternal Sabbath, the eternal rest, which is laid up for us in Jesus Christ, who having won for us victory over sin and death, eternally reigns at your right hand as our prophet and priest and king. Our hope and our faith is in him alone, and our prayers ascend to you by him and through him alone. 
We pray all of this in his name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're able, please stand and take your bulletin. We have a responsive reading as our call to worship this morning from Psalm 103. The end of that psalm, I'll read the pastor's line. We can respond together. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, all you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Let's respond together by singing. Take your blue hymnal, go to number 204. O come my soul, bless thou the Lord.
Amen. Brothers and sisters, people of God, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. He greets us with his grace, and he calls us his own. Receive the Lord's greeting. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God our Father be upon you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Amen. Please take your bulletin, and we'll affirm our faith together using words from Philippians chapter 2. Christians, what do we believe concerning our Lord Jesus Christ? Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated. We'll make preparation uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper the next Lord's Day, one week from today. So uh, in order to do that, we turn to page 149. 149 in our blue hymnal. And we'll read the preparatory exhortation uh, from form number two. On our weekly update email, which most of you get, but not all of you understand, um, we gave some instructions regarding uh, the procedure for next week. And so we want to make sure you all have, have some grasp of that. So if, you're, if you want to know that and haven't read that yet and need to be aware of those details, come and see an elder or see me after the service today or either service today. And uh, we'll tell you how we're going to go through that and to observe the sacrament the Holy Sacrament of the Lord's Supper in these unique times as we're uh, continuing to, uh, to watch and be sensitive and be careful in the midst of uh, the current health situations. Form number two, celebration of the Lord's Supper. We read this uh, not out of a, a desire to be ritualistic, but because we know that through these words uh, we can carefully examine our hearts, we can be reminded of the meaning of the Lord's Supper, and uh, we can seek God's goodness and His grace as we desire to observe the the, uh, sacrament of communion rightly. We'll follow along page 149 as I read the preparatory exhortation. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, Attend to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord as they have been handed down by the Apostle Paul. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, this do in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink the cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh, eateth and drinketh judgment unto himself, if he discern not the body. In obedience to these words, And in fellowship with the church universal, universal, we shall commemorate the death of our Savior in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper on the coming Lord's Day. However, to do so, to our comfort, we must first examine ourselves as the Apostle has admonished. Let each of us, therefore, consider his sin and guilt against against which the wrath of God is so great that he has punished it in his beloved Son with the bitter and shameful death of the cross. And let him examine whether his heart accordingly is filled with that godly sorrow which worketh repentance unto salvation. 
Let each of us also search his heart to see whether he truly believes in Jesus Christ as his only Savior and accepts the gracious promise of God that for the sake of the passion and death of Christ, all his sins are now forgiven him, and he is clothed with the perfect righteousness of the Son of God. Finally, let each of us examine his conscience to see whether he resolves in all sincerity and gratitude to serve Jesus Christ as the Lord, and in all things to live by his commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. As we thus examine ourselves, let us be assured that God will certainly receive in grace and welcome to the table of his Son all those who walk in this repentance and faith. On the contrary, those who are yet unrepentant or unbelieving eat and drink judgment to themselves if they partake. They are admonished by the Lord through his apostle to abstain from this holy supper, lest their punishment be made heavier. Therefore, we also charge those who willfully continue in their sins to keep themselves from the table of the Lord, such as all who trust in any form of superstition, all who honor images or pray to saints, all who despise God's word or the holy sacraments, all who take God's name in vain, all who desecrate the Lord's day, all who are disobedient to those in authority over them, all drunkards, gamblers, murderers, thieves, adulterers, liars, and unchaste persons. To all such, we say in the name of the Lord that as long as they remain unrepentant and unbelieving, they have no part in the kingdom of God. However, this solemn warning is not intended, beloved in the Lord, to discourage the contrite hearts of believers. For we do not come to this supper claiming any merit in ourselves. On the contrary, we come testifying that we seek our salvation apart from ourselves in Jesus Christ. By this testimony, we humbly confess that we are full of sin and worthy of death. By this testimony, we also confess that we believe the sure promise of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This promise assures us that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can hinder us from being received by God in grace and accounted worthy partakers of his heavenly food and drink. Thus assured, let us at the appointed hour come with quiet conscience and fullness of faith to keep this sacramental feast which our Lord appointed to be a continual memorial of his atoning death until he comes again, that we may obtain help in this. Let us implore God for his grace. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, by whose law all men are tried and by whose gospel we have hope, we, your servants, look to you for help in the self-examination to which we have been called. You, O God, of your grace, you have bid us come to the table of your Son. In mercy regard our miseries and have compassion on us in all our weaknesses. We bring accusation against ourselves and lay transgression to our charge. Enable each of us in the light of your holy word to read the secrets of his own heart and to recognize the fruits of your work of grace within. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit so that we may obediently heed your call in sincere repentance and true faith. Graciously remove whatever in us might impede our coming. Let no love of sin or untruth, no pride or lust of heart, no hatred or envy toward our neighbor, no remnant of unbelief remain within us to hinder our glad response. By your Spirit, assemble us at the appointed hour to commemorate in an unbroken bond of Christian fellowship the atoning death of our Savior. Hear us, we pray unto you, in the name of our ever-living intercessor, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, belong all praise and glory. Amen. Let's continue to ponder the price paid for us on the cross. Remain seated, go to number 381 in our blue hymnal. Man of Sorrows, what a name. 381, Man of Sorrows.
Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father and great God, we come unto you this morning. We renounce all of our self-reliance and self-trust. We confess that we have broken your law, we have strayed from your commandments, we have disobeyed you, we have disregarded you, we have forgotten you. And so we ask that you would cleanse us anew this morning. We ask that you would give us a oneness of purpose to glorify you and to exalt you, to serve you all of our days. We pray that you would minister to each of us according to our needs. You alone know what we need, which, and our needs are so many. We pray that you would come and you would do your work in each one according to your good pleasure. We pray that you would bring life to dead hearts. We pray that you would strengthen faith where it is weak. We pray that you would build up virtue where it is needed. We pray that you would fill with the Spirit where there is lacking. We praise you that you have brought us together today and that you have brought us together as a congregation. We pray uh, that you would lead us on into the future. We pray that you would empower and build up each one of us that uh, we may be the kind of people you have called us to be, that we may serve you that we may be a light in the world, a light in the darkness. We pray that you would equip each one of us to be able to do that which you need us to do so that those around us may see and know the truth of who you are, what a high calling you have given to each of us to, to walk according to the manner of the gospel. We pray that you would hear our prayer day after day as we come unto you, we pray that you would be with all who are sick, all who are hurting, all who are distressed. We pray that you would be, uh, that, that you would uh, rebuke and convict and call back those who are wandering. We pray that you would keep back from sin those who are teetering on the edge. We pray that you would endow each of us with a deep sense of your holiness and your majesty, that holiness before which we will stand on judgment day. There will be no denying the depth of our sin. There will be no denying or arguing with any of your righteous judgments for all who have ever lived, for we will see much more fully the light and the flame of your holiness. Help us to live life backwards from that day and to see meaning and purpose and calling in light of what happens at the end, in light of the, the inheritance you have laid up for us. We pray that we want to lift up our brother Roger Bonema to you. We pray that you would be with him, you'd comfort him, bring healing to his body, allow the procedure to do its intended work. Pray that you would reunite him with family soon, lift up the family as well. There are others who are hurting, others who are sick, others who are grieving. Be with each one. We thank you that you are a loving Father, full of compassion and kindness. We live in a world that is filled with uncertainty, with strife, with hatred, with malice, with anger, violence. We confess that we cannot change this world on our own. We have no hope of doing so. We need you. We need your sovereign power. We need you to work. We give it all into your hands, and we ask that you would give us the courage and the strength to continue to live for you and to serve you where you have called us to do so. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in our lives and in this world. We pray that we would see peace. We pray that we would see unrest and, and all that we're seeing around us come to an end, but most of all that you would build your kingdom and call people to yourself. We pray that you would bless the preaching of your gospel throughout the world. Gather your church, assemble your people. May you be honored and glorified on this day and forevermore. In Christ's name we pray.
Amen. For our sermon this morning, we have a, a ministry of music from Patty and Lynn. Judges chapter 16. Use the Pew Bible in front of you if you'd like. That's found on page 398. As you're turning there, I'd like to say Happy Father's Day, especially uh, to you dads. A wonderful time to uh, to remember and, and to reflect on, on God's goodness. 
and ultimately to remember the, the kinds of things that uh, the best things about dads in this life remind us of our, of our Heavenly Father as we sang this morning. His love is like a father's to his children, tender and kind uh, to all who fear his name. I think in my lifetime it's always it's somewhat been customary to, um, you know, have got Mother's Day, which you, know, you got to do everything right and that's so important. And then at church on Father's Day you kind of downplay it. I'm kind of trying to make sure that we honor both equally. I want to say to you dads, that certainly a passion in my life and in my ministry is to, to teach and to train men about the importance of, of their calling and uh, how indispensable you are in the lives, uh, particu- particularly of your children. Uh, it is a battle. This life uh, presents so many challenges in so many ways uh, that uh, perhaps men or dads can find excuses to shirk their responsibilities. Don't do that. Read God's word, trust his spirit, trust in his goodness, and uh, he will equip you to do that uh, which you are needed to do. It, it cannot be overstated how important um, fathers are, and, and we're, we're reminded of that in so many ways uh, all throughout the world. So I challenge you to do that, but I thank you, I thank God for you and for the role that you play uh, in the lives of, of your family. And then perhaps also fitting, if I can just have a little fun, and I'm, I'm poking fun at myself here too, as you'll find out in a second, but providentially fitting, well, providentially fitting that uh, we, on Father's Day, have a, a passage where we see a man who once was given by God a, a head full of beautiful flowing hair, and at, by the end of the story, it's all gone. So... Uh, lamentable in that sense. And I've seen some of the late 70s church directories. I know some of you had those heads of long flowing hair, uh, so we can, we can uh, be nostalgic together. But this is uh, the story of Samson, perhaps one of the, the end of Samson's earthly life, perhaps one of the most well-known stories in all of Scripture, given by God, true, without error, Perfectly fit to accomplish his purposes. This is Judges chapter 16. Hear now from God's holy word. One day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength. And how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had not been dried, And she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then, with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, Until now you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin... I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again she called to him, Samson, 
The Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their god saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women, All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah his father. He had led Israel 20 years. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. There's maybe nothing that is more tragic or difficult than watching someone you love or whom you might care, about whom you might care, have a deep affection for them, Uh, to see them wander off down a destructive path and start to approach the the precipice of destruction through uh, some kind of sin or sinful pattern or sinful behavior. This can be very agonizing because uh, you can see the direction they're going. You can see where they're headed right over a cliff, but uh, they don't see it. You could take, for instance, uh, someone who may struggle with a substance abuse or an addiction, and and there may be long periods in this person's life where uh, they're not partaking of this particular destructive behavior. But there, in some instances, there emerges this, this recurring pattern where after a while of not struggling with it, all of a sudden they, they, they start to to peek back into the, the way their life was when they were partaking. So they start hanging around the old friends, or they go to the same kind of parties, or they start hanging around uh, a bar. And we all have heard of stories like this, and we know that this is often how it happens. You see that he's tragically 
headed towards a relapse, but his sin has blinded him. So then blind to the danger of his sin, then it chips away at his strength. Since he's blind to it and already weakened, then it takes away uh, his defense and it cuts away at it more and more. And it does so until it can swoop in for the kill. These aren't easy things to, to think about, but we know that sin works this way. Big sins and little sins. It blinds you, it takes away your strength, it chips away, and then it swoops in for the kill. It completely takes over when your defenses are no longer able to resist. This would be nothing if not tragic, if not for the hope of grace. I'm always, I'm always struck by the, the power of the gospel in prison ministry. And you have so many uh, who are brought to this very low place, undeniable uh, that their life has gotten off track. But they find hope in the Savior, in a God who forgives and who cleanses. One of the things that failure does is it makes self-reliance and self-trust impossible. And also makes it true that as you look back on past failures in your life, you realize, you understand that trusting in your own strength has never led to triumph. Whenever you trusted in yourself, whenever you thought you were strong enough to get through it on your own, that is when you have fallen. So here's our life-transforming reality today. Since sin blinds us and weakens us, and we can't fight it on our own, we must run in faith to our hero who saved more through his death than while he lived. We must run to our hero who saved more through his death than while he lived. First, this idea of being blinded by sin. You see that in Samson. You see it come to a pinnacle here in this chapter. Before we do that, I'd just like to mention one thing as we work through this story. In Judges, women are often portrayed as virtuous, as, uh, as helpful. You think of Deborah, you think of Samson's mother. Uh, they're portrayed as uh, good, virtuous, God-fearing women. The book of Judges doesn't have a, a low view of women at all. But in Samson's life, his interaction with Philistine women, you always see that acting as a, as a picture of, of sinfulness and transgression. Right? So the more Samson is entangled with Delilah, the more you see sin at work in his life. And that's not because judges or the scriptures are communicating that women are inherently more sinful than men. In fact, the narrator of Judges has his finger pointed at Samson. And look, look, look at how much he is failing to see God's call. just want to mention that because as you work through this story, it, the more he interacts with Philistine women, the more sinful uh, he is. Is being, and that is first and foremost a condemnation against Samson. But something that you see in chapter 16 is that he no longer even realizes his sin. He no longer even realizes that what he is doing is out of the norm. Remember, back at the beginning of knowing Samson as a man, he sees this Philistine woman, the the, the woman that he married all the way back a couple chapters. And he sees her, he sees that she's pleasing to the eyes, he sees that he desires her, and he goes after her. By the time we come to chapter 16, that's not what's happening. Samson is no longer seeing, in other words, he's no longer even realizing the kinds of paths he is walking down. So one commentator says, Womanizing is no longer just something that Samson does. It has become who he is. It has come to define him. And that's what sin does. When you allow sin to run its course in your life, when you fail to search your heart, when you fail to ask God to search your heart, your sensitivity to those things will go down proportionately. Your realization of your sin will decrease and diminish, and eventually it comes to define you. The book of Proverbs says, passion makes the bones rot. The book of Proverbs also says, unjust riches eat away at the life of a man. Sin runs against the fabric, it cuts against the fabric of humanity. It kills slowly, and as it kills slowly, then it comes to redefine. We live in an age that's obsessed with self-identity and, and 
How do you identify or how do you conceive of yourself? Well, if you're running down the path of sinfulness, sin will come to define you and you will not have any choice in the matter. There are many pictures of sinfulness in the life of Samson, aren't there? The first one is the way in which his words come to condemn him. His words come back to be a sign of his condemnation. Samson is a riddler. He's a punster. And it shows that he has this very low view of his words, of his ability to speak. It's not a way to honor God. It's a way to have fun. It's a way to play around with sin. And this is one of the pictures of sinfulness. Remember, all the way back in chapter 14, at his wedding, he gives this riddle. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. He poses it as a game, a challenge to those at his wedding. Do you know the answer to this riddle? They figure out the answer by going to, through Samson's wife. He spills the beans to his wife. She then tells her fellow countrymen. And they come back to him and they say, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? Samson loses that challenge then, of course, because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But this riddle and the answer to the riddle, in a sense, become a picture of Samson's life in general. Because for Samson, what is sweeter than honey? The love of a woman. The love of women that he should not go after, right? And what is stronger than a lion? Well, women who have control of Samson are stronger than a lion. Samson proved that he himself was stronger than a lion because he killed one with his bare hands. But these women who take control of Samson's life, particularly Delilah at the end, she becomes stronger than him. There's also a, an up and down, a topographical, geographical movement to Judges. The beginning of chapter 16, we have this very short and, and shocking, interesting account. He's in Gaza. He goes in to be with the prostitute. The men of the Philistines, they, they understand that he's there, so they surround him during the night. A very short story, but he escapes in the middle of the night, tears the doors off of the gate, which is a, an amazing feat of human strength, shows once again his, his unbelievable strength given to him by God. And then he carries it to the top of a mountain that's facing Hebron. And what that is doing, it's just painting a picture of worship. In the Old Testament, God's people go up to Jerusalem. God often meets his people on the top of a mountain. Uh, that's where, where worship happens, right? M going up. Ascending is, is a worshipful thing. That's why when they built our church building in the 50s, the first thing you do is come up those stairs. Right? And many of you spent so many years asking why they did that because it ended, we ended up having to build an elevator to get around that fact. But that's why they did it. You ascend to worship. You go up into worship to worship the Lord. Church buildings used to be built with that kind of a sensitivity. How can we worship God better with the things that we build. And so Samson goes up, and it's this worshipful picture. He's, he's facing Hebron, which is connected with Old Testament worship in the time of the judges. But then, so you're thinking, is this a turning point in Samson's life? Is he now going to serve the Lord? But what is the next thing he does? He goes down into the valley of Sorek, and he falls in love with Delilah. So you're, you're tempted to see, oh, maybe he's turning the corner. Maybe now he's going to serve the Lord. But he goes right back down to where he was. This is who Samson is. Sin has come to define him. It has become woven into the fabric of his character. This reminded me of, of the story of Cain and Abel. Remember, Cain kills his brother. He's speaking with God. And what does God say to him? Sin's desire is for you. You must come to master it. You must come to overpower it. You must come to control it. And sin is ruling over Samson. He is blinded by sin, no longer realizing the kind of life he, he uh, is living. He is in a perfect place now where he could be stripped of everything. And the same is true for us. Sin's desire since the beginning is always the same. Its desire is for you. It wants to define you. It wants to take away your sight and your strength and be woven into the fabric of who you are. Don't think that this isn't a battle. Don't think that this isn't a lifelong war because when you, think, when you start to think that, that's when you've already become to be blinded by it. Sin will come to define us. What once feels new and exciting, perhaps exhilarating, just becomes who you are. Normal. 
Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's the prayer of someone who knows and understands that he needs the work of God in his heart to stay back from the blindness that sin can cause. Sin blinds you, then it overpowers you. Then it overpowers you once your defenses are down. After that short account, then we have this interaction with Delilah, Samson and Delilah. This comes to be sort of the the pinnacle of Samson outside of the prison before he is captured. The name Delilah is a very pretty sounding name, isn't it? But it sounds like the Hebrew word for night. And that's probably a pretty good summary of what Delilah is. She certainly would have been very beautiful. But she will end up leaving Samson in the dark, both literally and literally and figuratively. Through her, he loses his eyesight. Through her, his entire life uh, comes, comes to be a dungeon, literally and, and figuratively. Samson's whole life has been a dangerous game, hasn't it? It's been interesting looking at every single episode, all that he did. It's all just been one big dangerous game to him. And that has been the tragedy, right? He has missed his calling, set aside for the work of God, set aside to uh, be a deliverer of God's people, set aside to be a hero. But most of the time, he spends his time in enemy territory, but not at war, but playing with sin. His relationship with Delilah is an allegory of his whole life. He's become such a menace to the Philistines and the number that he has killed is, is many. Right? He, he killed a thousand with the donkey's jawbone. He's slaughtered them at other times. And it's always because of his personal escapades. But he himself is a national crisis to them. They offer Delilah an exorbitant amount of money. Find out where his strength is. Find out how you can overpower him. And the, the, the amount of money is, is out of this world right? for that time in that part of the world. There's this drawn-out story, uh, this back and forth, four chapters of Delilah and Samson going back and forth, four movements. Tell me where your source of strength is. Samson begins with kind of a joking around. It's so ridiculous. Tie me up with seven fresh animal tendons. So he's, he's messing with her, but at the same time, we're seeing, a, again, a low view of his Nazarite vow. Animal tendons that have not yet dried, those would be considered part of a corpse. And Hebrews, those who would serve God through the the Israelite religion, you could not touch an animal corpse. It was unclean. And for a Nazarite, they especially could not touch anything unclean. And so Samson is showing us once again, he doesn't care about the regulations in his life. He would rather just have fun. He would rather uh, just play a game with the woman that he keeps running after. The stakes are raised each movement in his interaction with Delilah. You keep saying, just stop. (laughs) Just stop it. Why are you continuing down this path? And the last time that he lies to her, he actually brings her into contact with his hair. Did you notice that? The stakes are raised each time. And that's a picture that shows us as Samson moves through his life, the stakes are raised. Even though he's always messing around and he thinks he's playing and joking around and he'll slip out of it when he needs to, we know he's heading one step closer to the precipice of disaster. It's the same thing when you see people in your life and you say they're on a bad path. They don't know it. They don't see it. They don't realize it, but they're headed to the precipice of disaster. And oftentimes, even in our own hearts, we can convince ourselves that, oh, I'll be fine. I'll slip out of it. I'll be able to break free. You think it's under control, and that's exactly what your sinful nature, that's exactly what Satan, the enemy, wants you to think, because it blinds you, and then it saps your strength. You say to Samson as you read it, how foolish can you possibly be? Just stop. What are you doing? But imagine what God sees and what God must think when he sees his people setting themselves on paths of sinfulness, sinful patterns, sinful behavior. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees the lack of wisdom in one choice and the next choice and the next choice. And think about what he sees and what he thinks 
when he sees his children doing that. Delilah nags at him. She won't give up. We're reminded that this is exactly what happened with Samson's first wife, aren't we? If he could have just kept his mouth shut and wouldn't have told his first wife the answer to that riddle, then he never would have lost that challenge. But the last time, all he does is he needs to give some clothes to those who defeat him. This time, he loses his life. See, the stakes are always raised. The longer you mess around with sin, the higher the stakes become. In verse 17, we read that Samson tells Delilah everything. Really, you could translate that. He told her his heart. An amazing phrase. He told her his heart. He spilled his heart to Delilah, this one who wants to destroy him, this one who wants to take advantage of all that he tells her. Sin does the same thing. Sin demands the heart, and it only promises destruction. That's one similarity between sin and God, isn't it? They both demand the heart. God says, serve me with all of your heart. Let everything within you be oriented towards the service of me. And what does God give you when we give him our heart? What does he give? What does he promise? Eternal life, eternal blessedness. Samson, for bearing his heart, what does he get? His strength is gone. He wakes up, He says, oh, well, I'm in another pickle. I guess I'll just break free because I'm always strong enough to do that. But you play around with sin long enough and someday there will be a day where you wake up and you no longer have the strength and the ability to break free. The man who always went wherever he wanted and usually it was where where he shouldn't have been. He was always going to places he shouldn't be. But he always went wherever he wanted. He ends up in prison. Can't go anywhere, period. The man who always followed his eyes, the man who always saw what what was pleasing in my eyes and what do I want, the man who always followed his eyes has his eyes gouged out. It's the ultimate humiliation to the one who should have been the ultimate hero. He trusted in his own strength. He saw no reason to serve anyone but himself, but he didn't consider what sin demands. Sometimes we think about sin and, oh, you know, I can kind of, I can make exceptions. There are a lot of people who struggle with this sin. There are uh, many people that are good Christians have struggled with this level of, of anger or bitterness or lust or rage or mistreating others or gossip. But it demands the heart. There's a twofold disaster with Samson. His strength leaves him, and then the Lord leaves him. And it's at that point, in verses 18 and 19, he bears his heart to Delilah, and all of a sudden, Delilah becomes the subject of all the verbs. She completely takes over. She tells the men to come. She uh, is able to have his hair shaved, and he loses control. Control is completely lost because that's what happens with sin. So his strength is gone, and God is gone. It's one thing to be without your gifts. It's quite another to be without God, right? Give me all the world. It's still nothing if you don't have Jesus. But not all hope is lost. And that's the wonder of grace. Verse 22 says, his hair began to grow again. And that tells us that not all hope is lost. And it tells us about the triumph of grace. Samson is blind. He's weak. But he's finally ready to be used of God. Sapped of his strength where he doesn't want to be, now all of a sudden, this is the moment where God works through him. This is the moment where victory and triumph can be most clearly seen in Samson. It's amazing that he goes from so high to so low, utterly humiliated, working in a prison, grinding. In the final moments of of Samson's life, it's undeniable the connection to Jesus. We have such a wonderful picture of of Jesus as his greatest victory, his greatest triumph is in his death. But before that, we have a picture of ourselves. Samson is a sinner. Samson is one whose whole life has really mostly been defined by sin. And so before he's a picture of Christ, he's a picture of the rest of us. And I think one of the great lessons of Samson's life is that we should seek to be brought to a place where we renounce renounce all self-reliance and all self-trust 
and realize that we must look outside of ourselves for hope. Most of us aren't going to have a rap sheet quite like Samson, the kind of life that he lived and the kinds of things that he experienced. But if we ask God, show me the depth of my sin, show me the the offensiveness of my sin before you. It's like we prayed today. On Judgment Day, everything will be viewed in the light, the flame of God's holiness, and no judgment will be denied. No one would dare question the judgment of God on Judgment Day. And everything that we ever did will look infinitely more sinful than it it did when we did it. And so if we ask God, God, please teach me, help me to know, help me to see the depth of my sin, help me to see especially my capacity for evil, if I rely on my own strength, if I trust in myself, my life very well may look like the life of Samson. But help me to see sin as you see it. Help me to see the depth of my own sin so that I may look in my own heart and say, I am the foremost of sinners, like the Apostle Paul said. Me, I'm the foremost of sinners because only I can look into my own heart. I can't look into your heart, but with God's help, I can look into mine. And so through that, we can be brought to a place where, as Samson is forced to do, he has to renounce his self-reliance and his self-trust because it's gone. His sight is gone. His strength is gone. But if we can learn to lean on God before that point and that he would empower us to use that which he has given us to serve him. That's the great tragedy of Samson. He serves himself with his giftedness. He serves himself with his strength. But to ask God, allow me to use that which you have given me to serve you. Charles Spurgeon says, Our life derives all its strength from God. And if he deigns to make us strong, we cannot be weakened by the wiles of the adversary. Strength that comes from God doesn't go away. Strength that comes from God lasts forever. Samson was in the last place he wanted to be, but he was finally right where he needed to be for God to work through him. Remember, his whole life has been about this fomenting conflict between the Philistines and the Israelites. God has been behind all of it and working in and through the situation so that he would bring Samson right to where he is at this moment so that he might use him in the way that he appointed for him to be used. There's this this exiting of Samson's ego and the story ends really with a clash between the God of the Bible and Dagon. You see how the people almost have a, start having a worship service when Samson is brought out. They're singing to their God. A reminder that when God grants victory, when God grants blessing, or any in that time of the world, people who would worship any God, if they were given a victory on the battlefield, they would sing to their God. Samson, when he was given victory, would make a riddle about himself. or He would sing about himself. You go back to Judges chapter 5, Deborah writes a song of praise to God after the victory. Wonderful to be reminded of that, but also sad to see the way that uh, Samson has rejected his calling again and again. But it also shows that uh, the Philistines are saying, our God, Dagon, has given us victory over this warrior. He's delivered him into our hands. Look at how wonderful this is. And it shows us that everything in Samson's life had cosmic importance. Everyone could look at Samson's life, even though he was living it according to his own will, doing whatever he wanted. There was this cosmic importance to all that he did. And to you, brothers and sisters, I say that everything that you do, there is cosmic importance. You are either serving the God of the Bible, or you are serving your own desires. And all of that will be brought to light one day. And it makes us understand and know the importance of, that every day has, every day that's before us. There's this clash then between the God of Scripture and Dagon. And as we often see, the God of Scripture wins. He doesn't need a warrior who's equipped with great strength. If Samson is almost like the Achilles of the Bible, 
the greatest warrior that we have all throughout Scripture, the strongest one of, in all of God's people, perhaps. But it's when he's weak. It's when he's humiliated that God says, now I will triumph. Because he does not triumph through the strength of a human arm. He does not triumph through earthly chariots and horses. He triumphs through his own power. Like Samson, Jesus comes from a place of great strength. But Jesus' strength is so far beyond that of Samson's. Like Samson, Jesus was humiliated, brought low compared to where he was. But Jesus did not deserve his humiliation, yet he willingly takes it on for me and for you. Just like Samson, Jesus won a great victory, a greater victory through his death than all of the good in his life. The Gospel of John says you couldn't fill, the the whole world would be filled with the books if you tried to document every good thing that Jesus did in his life. Healing, teaching, encouraging. And yet through his death, he saves more. Just like through Samson's death, that was his greatest victory. He had this whole long line of these Amazing victories in battle. He was a one-man army, slaying thousands of Philistines. But he kills more through his death than he did in his life. And Jesus saves more through his death than he did in his life. So we're pointed to Jesus Christ. But we're pointed to the majesty of Jesus because we see how much better he is than Samson. A righteous man who lived his whole life in service to God, the exact opposite of Samson, a righteous man who did not deserve the humiliation, but who is brought low so that he might save to remind us that the God of the Bible saves in ways that men and women would never think of, not according to human strength, but according to his grace. Dagon is no match for the God of Scripture, the one who has crushed sin and death and hell. So let this God be your salvation and your strength. Let him be your strength. Know that you do not have the strength in yourself to fight this battle. There is sin that's working in you. There is sin that's at work in the world. There is an enemy that is up to the challenge, that wants you, that wants to claim you. Thus you need to live in the strength of another. Build your life on the power of the cross. The victory that God shows us that happens when it's least expected. And ask this God to make you more dependent upon him. And as you think about the life of Samson, it is a beautiful picture of Christ that he, he delivers more through his death than he does in his life. But you who are given time on this earth, your goal ought to be that you would serve God with your life, that you would serve God with your giftedness, that you would serve God with what he has given to you, because Samson didn't do that, right? He wasted all of it. He wasted all of it. But let the the mentality of someone like Paul the Apostle, who says in Philippians chapter 1, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that now, as always, Christ would be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Every moment that he gives you, what is it for? To serve God. Every moment that he gives you, what is it for? To glorify him, to honor him, to live in light of the truth of who he is in his kingdom. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Samson had to figure that out, didn't he? But to us who can know it by God's grace, you can then say along with the psalmist, whom shall I fear? If the Lord is the stronghold of your life, then of whom shall you be afraid? There's nothing to fear. We end once again with the words of Charles Spurgeon. He says this, The powers of darkness are not to be feared, for the Lord, our light, destroys them. And the damnation of hell is not to be dreaded by us, for the Lord is our salvation. This is a very different challenge from that of boastful Goliath, for it rests not upon the conceited vigor of an arm of flesh, but upon the real power of the omnipotent I am. That's where strength comes from. It comes from God, who's our light, our salvation, our strength, and our hope. So renounce self-reliance, renounce self-trust. Understand what sin can do. It'll blind you. It'll sap your strength. When your defenses are down, it'll destroy you. Rather, live in light of the forgiveness, the life we have in Christ, 
and live in light of the power of the cross, let that be your source of strength rather than anything that God has even given you. It all comes from him anyways. We have to orient it to the service of him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and great God, we thank you for your word. Difficult passages and stories from the history of God's people. We know that you're sovereign over it all. We know that you had appointed, before the foundations of the earth were laid, you had appointed that moment where Samson would push down the pillars and thus, and thus begin to deliver your people from the Philistines. We thank you that there's a greater deliverance in Christ, the deliverance from sin. Help us to, to lay down all of our tendencies to look to ourselves. Help us to know and to understand the end of that road, what happens when we trust in ourselves. Help us to see our sin in light of your holiness. And help us to serve you all of our days. Forgive us, cleanse us, renew us, empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together, sing number 330. 330 in our blue hymnal. O Jesus, we adore thee. 330. O Jesus, we adore thee. Stand together and sing. Receive God's benediction. May the God of peace, God himself, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept, be kept blameless till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.